Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about multiple sclerosis obviously today. Uh, so just as a brief introduction, uh, I wanted to tell you that sclerosis is a, uh, actually comes from the Greek, Greek word skleros, which means heart. And that's just what multiple sclerosis plaques are. They're hard plaques. Uh, okay, it's stuck. <laughs> So uh, just a briefing on the demographics of multiple sclerosis. It's an autoimmune disease, a T-cell mediated type 4 hypersensitivity disease that is usually more common in females than it is in males. There's a two to one uh, female to male ratio, and it's more common in middle-aged individuals, uh, in white populations, especially those who live around the temperate zones, um, probably owing to the fact that there is low vitamin D uh, and it has a genetic predisposition. So there's the HLA-DR2 uh, gene. Um, individuals who have this are more likely to develop multiple sclerosis. And there are also environmental triggers, uh, such as cigarette smoking, UV radiation, and um, it's associated with EBV virus as well as HHV6. Uh, okay. Uh, so just a briefing on the pathophysiology of multiple sclerosis. So it does have, as I said before, both genetic and environmental causes. And it's um, basically due to a loss of the tolerance of uh, the body to myelin. So what happens is T cells, mostly CD4 plus T cells, as well as T helper 17 cells and uh, T helper 1 cells, they attack the myelin of the body. Uh, and there's also an association between B cells and multiple sclerosis. So what happens is you have uh, the normal nerve conduction here uh, in a normal nerve fiber and uh, the T cells come and they attack the myelin. And what happens is it gets damaged. So the signals get distorted. Um, okay. Uh, there's also, uh, if, we, if we're going to look at the radiology and pathology of the disease, it's a multiple sclerosis, so you're obviously going to have multiple plaques uh, on brain MRI that are separated, uh, it's known to be separated in both space and time. So the plaques are going to be separated in space, and then we're going to talk about the symptoms that are going to be separated in time. Uh, and this is a grass image uh, for uh, post-mortem for the brain, and you have this plaque. And it's a gray colored plaque, which uh, shows multiple sclerosis. Um, and a period of time has uh, elapsed after multiple sclerosis. It's usually salmon pink uh, when, when, uh, if we diagnose it uh, or if we see it at that time. Uh, so what happens is they take a biopsy and they manage to stain it using something called a luxofast blue pass stain. And there's rarefaction. This is exactly the region where multiple sclerosis has occurred. It's a bit lighter, as you can see in the area surrounding it. Uh, to the right, there's just an image of normal myelin. This is what myelin should look like, but you don't get that with multiple sclerosis. The, the lines are actually gone. Um, OK. Uh, and then there's this guy. He's uh, uh, Dr. Bernard mentioned him a few times. He's uh, Jean Martin Charcot. He's a French neurologist. Uh, he was um, he worked in the middle 19th century, and what he actually did was uh, he had like 15 around 15 eponyms. His name was everywhere, and uh, one of the things that he uh, developed uh, uh, he's uh, named after the Charcot's neurologic triad. It's a triad that involves cerebellar and brainstem symptoms that are seen in multiple sclerosis patients. So multiple sclerosis patients would might present with nystagmus, dysarthria, and intention tremors. But the thing is, these are always sensitive. They're not specific to multiple sclerosis. Um, and then, of course, there are other clinical features, such as the blurred vision due to optic nerve demyelination that may be in one eye or both eyes, internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Usually patients have a difficulty moving their eye horizontally, but they don't have a problem converging it, converging their vision. Um, they would have vertigo and scanning speech, uh, hemiparesis and unilateral loss of sensation, acute myelitis um, with um, lower extremity, uh, loss of sensation and weakness of bowel and bladder function changes in cognition, constipation, and pain. And the most common site of demyelination in multiple sclerosis is, of course, the optic nerve. So what happens is if we perform a fundoscopy exam, this is what a normal optic nerve should look like. But with multiple sclerosis, you get demyelination, and this is what it actually looks like. So this is the demyelinating portion. 
Um, also, characteristically, there are central scotomas seen in multiple sclerosis patients. So you have this black dot in the middle of a patient's vision. Uh, there are also certain signs and, uh, that are associated with multiple sclerosis. They're, again, they're sensitive but not specific, such as Lermit's sign or Barber chair's phenomenon. Uh, patients experience a shock-like or electricity-like pain, uh, shooting pain once they flex their necks, and this pain goes down to their arms, to their back, to their legs sometimes. And there's the Otoff's phenomenon. An Otoff's phenomenon is uh, characterized by uh, reversible exacerbation of the signs and symptoms, whatever sign uh, symptoms that patient has, uh, with anything that involves heat, hot or humid weather, sunlight, hair dryers, um, exercise, uh, hot tubs, hot baths, and infec infections and hormonal fluctuations. And then there's the course of the disease. So there are four different courses that multiple sclerosis can go through. It can be a relaxing, re remitting disease. You have the disease, you have bouts of the disease, and then the disease improves over time because of the demyelination and then the remyelination initially. And then it just gets worse. So a patient would have a certain symptom, and then over time, that symptom would not completely disappear. He'd still have it. And then there's the secondary progressive. So over time, that patient will get worse, um, will get worse and not improve. The primary progressive disease, he's going to just get worse from the start without bouts of relapse, uh, of uh, remission. And the worst one is the primary, um, the um, primary relapsing form of the disease. The patient gets worse over time and he will have on top of that exacerbations for the disease. This is the worst one and uh, relapsing remitting is the most common form of the disease. Okay, uh, so if we want to diagnose a patient with multiple sclerosis, we'll obviously need clinical diagnosis. The history and physical exam are the mainstay of diagnosis, but nowadays uh, with the help of uh, MRI, uh, the T1 gadolinium is 90, uh, MRI is 90% sensitive. Uh, there are also the Dawson's fingers that are seen on MRI, and they're just <clears throat> plaques that form around the ventricle. They're in the veins, and they just look like finger-like projections coming out. There's also the evoked potentials, which are going to show slowing of the conduction of nerve fibers. Uh, and uh, CSF results are usually nonspecific, so we'd rather measure them during uh, an exacerbation. Uh, these patients would have mild pleocytosis or lymphocytosis, uh, raised proteins that are myelin-based because of the destruction of myelin and oligoclonal bands. So as you can see here, the, this, is the, uh, this is what it normally should look like, but in a multiple sclerosis patient, you would have an exacerbation of the IgG bands. Um, there are many lines of treatment for multiple sclerosis, and the problem is that immunomodulation sometimes does not work. Um, owing to the complexity, perhaps, of the disease or because we don't understand what truly happens in multiple sclerosis. So uh, there's the, uh, so it depends on what form we have. Treatment depends on what form we have. We can treat the acute exacerbation or prevent exacerbations. And then we can also uh, provide supportive therapy for patients. Uh, usually primary progressive multiple sclerosis is very, uh, is very difficult to treat. So it's just based on supportive therapy. However, uh, relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis in secondary progressive type are usually uh, treated using high, high dose uh, glucocorticoids and then second line uh, plasmapheresis. Uh, if we want to prevent exacerbations, we can use different forms of drugs. Uh, these include uh, glutamer. It's a, uh, it resembles the myelin protein. What it does is it decoys uh, T cells from attacking myelin. There's also the interferon therapy that uh, we hear a lot about, and it uh, just diminishes the inflammatory response that results in the demyelination process. These are first-line drugs. There's also second-line natalizumab. Uh, it's obviously a monoclonal mon uh, antibody that uh, works against alpha-4 integrin in cells and is used in all patients who have failed first-line treatment. In secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, they're the same drugs, but we also have the anti-cancerous agents such as cyclophosphamide, methotrexate. Um, other disease-modifying agents are flingolimid. Uh, it's a sphingosine 1-phosphate analog and decreases lymphocyte migration, so there are fewer lymphocytes going to the CMS. Uh, teriflunomide is also used. It's a pyrimidine synthesis inhibitor and lowers the concentration of active lymphocytes in the CMS. Uh, there's also dimethyl fumarate, and it's uh, an oral agent, unlike the rest. 
Uh, it uh, alters cellular response to oxidative stress and reduces disease progression. And then there's um, metoxantron, which is a third line agent. It's a cytotoxic agent that kills T cells and is obviously used for, for multiple sclerosis. Um, and then there's, uh, since multiple sclerosis more often uh, occurs more often in females than it does in males, there it's an act, uh, pregnancy and multiple sclerosis is an area of ongoing research. So a uh, pregnant female is uh, more likely to have uh, less multiple sclerosis exacerbations during pregnancy, but afterwards the, uh, the, the, the symptoms of the disease are going to increase. Um, the pa patients, uh, female patients are more prone to cesarean sections and they are also more prone to having babies with lower birth weight. Uh, I'm just going to conclude with this uh, case, case presentation, a very short one, um, just to let you know that although that's what multiple sclerosis, that's what's written in books and uh, about multiple sclerosis, there it may be um, uh, you may have like patient, patients are patients are your books, so you may actually have a different presentation. So this is a case of a 38 year old male. He had headache for uh, eight weeks and visual disorientation for several hours and was afebrile and had a long history of severe depression. So the patient was sent for imaging, and this is the radiological image. So um, on, upon uh, on imaging, this is the MRI. And it involved the cortex, surprisingly, although multiple we know multiple sclerosis usually involves the white matter. And it also involved the white matter and the corpus callosum. And then there was a ring enhancing lesion uh, when, when uh, imaged using, uh, using gadolinium. So the patient was sent for surgery and the frozen section was obtained. And what the, uh, the pathologist did was they put a special stain. And this stain is known to it showed a sunburst appearance of mitosis. So mitosis is characteristic of tumors. And this patient was actually initially given radiotherapy. He was diagnosed with glioblastoma multiform. <clears throat> but uh, in a, a post-op, actually, this patient showed this sunburst appearance and, and, was, uh, and had actually multiple sclerosis. Uh, he was stained for macrophages, and these are the um, Macrophages, the, these, the brown colored cells are the macrophages of the foam cells that uh, contain all the debris from the myelin. And he was actually diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in the end. So that's basically it. So rules don't always apply in medicine. Uh, and that's basically it. Thank you.